Far more sweet the fragrance of the broken road. All right, Mark chapter 8, verse 34, the Bible says, And when he had called the people unto him with his disciples, also he said unto them, Whosoever shall come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross, and follow me. For whosoever shall save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in glory, in the glory of his Father, with the holy angels. Now, the other day I was thinking, and I do I think a lot, but I was thinking about the souls of men, and I was thinking how that most men today, and women, boys and girls, they don't want to talk about the Lord. They don't want you to witness to them. They call it proselytizing. Proselytizing is what they call it. And uh, that's what their, their word they try to use to degrade you for witnessing to people. But your job as a Christian is to witness to people. That's why you're left here. You're, you're left here to witness to people. But I was thinking the other day, you know, in one of my down moments, I'm thinking, you know, what's the use? You talk to these people and they don't want to hear it. They'll just turn away from you. Uh, the other day I had sold uh, my motorcycle and a guy came to pick it up. And, and um, we were talking there for a while and I began to witness to him a, a bit. And uh, I said, uh, I said, Roy, are you, are you saved? And he just looked at me and I said, uh, have you trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior? And he turned around and looked up in the sky and says, yes, yes. And then he changed the subject and went on. Now, if you're truly saved, and I'm not saying he's not. I'm just saying if you're truly saved, you should not be ashamed of the Lord. And you should not be ashamed of the fact that you've trusted him as your Savior. But a lot of people are. And uh, it's a sad thing. It's a sad thing. And I'm thinking about that and I thought, you know, what's the use in witnessing to people? They don't want to hear it. Everybody's heard it a dozen times over, and they just don't want to hear it. And then God smoked my heart, and he says, that's not the point. The point is, is you keep fishing, and you're eventually going to catch a fish. If you keep trying, if you keep giving the gospel out, eventually you're going to come across somebody that is just primed and ready to be saved. So that's our job as a Christian, is to make sure that we talk to people and give them the opportunity to be saved. Now, you're not going to win everybody you witness to. Uh, they're coming far and few between anymore. And you're not going to see everybody saved that you talk about the Lord to. But if you'll talk enough, you'll eventually win somebody to Jesus Christ. And that's our whole job here. The Lord has left us behind so that we could be witnesses for Him. Now, here in this chapter, the Lord Jesus Christ, during the time of His earthly ministry, was in the town of Caesarea Philippi, in the timeline of the passage before us now. He's just fed 4,000 people earlier in the chapter there in the wilderness. And that is a type of the miraculous feeding of Israel in the great tribulation period. God is going to feed Israel when Israel is on the run from the Antichrist and hiding over there in Selah Petra. The Lord is going to miraculous, miraculously feed them from the head, the wounded head of the dragon, the seven-headed red dragon there in heaven, according to the book of Revelation. Now, God is going to feed them miraculously, and that's what the feeding of the 4,000 was all about, is to show uh, them that one of these days he's going to do that uh, when Israel needs it most. And after that, in the town of Bethsaida, he heals a blind man by spitting in the man's eyes, and that's a type of Israel's spiritual blindness and their need for spiritual healing. See, all these miracles the Lord did, they point to something. Israel has been blinded, and they were blinded when the Lord shows up, and the Lord heals them, and it shows the nation of Israel that they need to be healed of their spiritual blindness. In 
the verses previous to our text, we find the confident, proud, cussing fisherman Peter exclaiming his own goodness and worth, and then he gets soundly rebuked by the Lord. The Lord says, in three days and three nights, he said, I'm going to be killed. He said, in three days and three nights, uh, I will rise again. And Peter says, the Bible said in verse 32, that Peter took him and began to rebuke him. In another passage over there in, in Luke or, or John, you find out where the Lord says, or in Matthew, the Lord says, uh, uh, Peter says, not so, Lord, not so. He said, that's not going to happen. Nobody's going to lay their hands on you. And the Lord rebukes him, and he says in verse 33, he looked at Peter and he said, Get thee behind me, Satan. He said, The word of God must be fulfilled. He said, I've got to do this. And he said, If you're standing between me and getting done what the Lord wants done, he said, uh, You're fulfilling Satan's work. And he called Peter Satan. He called Peter Satan. Now this conversation brings us in our text, to our text, and the text is one of true discipleship. The Lord reveals Peter's true attitude. It's one of personal pride. It's one of personal gratification. And it's proved out to be correct in that Peter later on uh, denies the Lord three times there at the palace of the high priest. And it showed exactly what the Lord was talking about. And he reveals to Peter and all the people around about him that true discipleship is true self-denial. If you want to be a disciple, and the word disciple just means one who follows the teachings of another, if you want to be a true disciple of Jesus Christ, then you've got to deny yourself and do what He wants you to do. That's what a true disciple is. Something else that is revealed to us in the words of the Lord is that the exchange of a soul, or in other words, the value of the souls of men. And that's what I was talking about when I first started here. You may look at this situation and say, what's the point of witnessing? Why should I witness? They don't want to hear it. They don't want to talk about it. So on and so forth. I remember one time Dr. Ruckman and Brother Donovan had made a visit on an old man who was Dr. Ruckman's age, been in World War II and everything, and Brother Donovan was telling me this. He said they went to the hospital to visit him. The man was on his deathbed, and uh, Dr. Ruckman and Brother Donovan walked in and began to try to talk to him and introduced him introduced uh, their selves to him and, and told them why they were there. And he said, uh, the fellow began to curse and, and curse Adam and curse preachers and all this stuff. And said, Dr. Upton just said, okay, bud, okay, and turned around and walked out of the room. And Brother Donovan is standing there in the room not knowing what to do. He said, you know, he's used to when somebody does that, you know, trying to talk to him. And I, but Dr. Upton just walked away. And Brother Donovan ran out the door and ran to meet him and, and caught him. And he says, uh, he said, Dr. Rubin, he said, don't we need to talk to him? Don't we, don't we, ought to, shouldn't we try to uh, win him? He said, man, he don't want to talk about him. He said, yeah, he said, but, uh, you know, nobody wants to talk about him. Dr. Rubin said, if they don't want to talk about it, they don't want to talk about him. Get him another time. So that's the kind of thing. Even though they don't want to talk about it, it is still our obligation to try. To try. Now let me ask you a question. When is the last time? that you tried to talk to somebody about the Lord? When is the last time you have tried to give out the gospel? Think about that in your own self. When's the last time you tried earnestly to see somebody go to heaven? Your soul is a part of you that is truly alive, for without it the body has no life in it, and the spirit has no abode. Genesis 2, 7 says, And the Lord God formed man uh, from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. When God created Adam, he made him body, he made him spirit, and he made him soul. Three parts. That's the way God is. God is three parts, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And God created Adam, body, soul, and spirit. And that's the way he created him. Man is a soul with a body, not a body with a soul. The most important part about you is not your body. The most important part about you is your soul. And you need to get a hold of that. And when you deal with people, you need to deal with them on that basis. You're not trying to deal with their body. You're not trying to clean them up. You're not trying to get them to quit drinking and quit smoking and quit taking drugs. What you're trying to do is get to that soul 
and trying to talk to that soul and trying to convince that soul that if he doesn't get right with God, that he's going to go to hell. That's what you've got to do. A man is a soul with a body, not a body with a soul. In Luke 16, we find that uh, the soul has a bodily shape. It's got ears. It's got eyes. It's got a mouth. It's got a tongue. It's got fingers. It's got lips. And over there in the book of Revelation, we find out that it also the soul also has a voice. It also has a memory. So really, what you think about is the soul is just a picture of the body, but it's not physical. It's not physical. Your soul, most importantly, is eternal. Once a man becomes a living soul, he never ceases to be a living soul. Now, if he dies and goes to hell, he will die forever because he cannot perish. He cannot burn up because the soul is not physical. So the soul just burns for eternity. And it'll burn as long as God's alive. And God will always be alive. And that thing goes like this. That body, that soul has all these things that a body has. But the important thing about it is that it is eternal. The Bible said in Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 7, He said, Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit shall return to God who gave it. So when a man passes away, he lays the body down, and quickly as he draws his last breath, as the heart beats its last beat, when the blood quits moving, that body immediately at that moment begins to disrupt. It begins to defile. It begins to corrupt immediately. And eventually that body, if left alone long enough, will turn back into dirt. Because God formed man from the dust of the ground. That's where your body comes from. If you look at your body, you find out your body is made of minerals and water. That's what it's made of dirt. And then the Bible says, the spirit returns to God who gave it. Everybody in here has the spirit of man. There are four spirits in the word of God. The spirit of man, the spirit of animals, the spirit of Antichrist, and the spirit of uh, God. Those are the only four spirits there are. Everybody here has the spirit of a man. If you had the spirit of an animal, you might be walking around here barking or yelling. You can find a good example of this over there in the book of Daniel, where Nebuchadnezzar gets too proud and boastful of himself, and he thinks that he's built the kingdom, brags about it, and God gives him the spirit of an animal. And it was so bad that they had to put a chain about him and tie him to a stump. And his hair grew out long and his fingernails grew out long. He looked like and acted like an animal. Because God gave him a different spirit. He gave him the spirit of an animal. But you don't have a spirit of an animal. You have the spirit of a man. That's why you act the way you do. You act like men. You act like, like uh, men that God has created and put upon the earth. Because that is your spirit. So everybody here has the same spirit of man. Now when you pass away, the body goes back to the dirt, and the spirit of man goes back to God who gave it. Everybody's spirit. Lost, saved, everybody's spirit goes back to God who gave it. Now that only leaves one, one part of you that leaves the soul. Now that soul is eternal. And once it becomes a living soul, it never ceases to be a living soul. And it will go one of two places. That soul will either go to heaven or it will go to hell. Well, that's the facts of the matter. That's what the Bible teaches. That's what God says is going to happen. When you leave this world, you'll go to one of two places, heaven or hell. You won't go to purgatory. That's some made-up childish fairy tale that the Catholics came up with to charge people money so that they could build the Vatican over there. I know that's the truth. That thing was made up. I forget who the Pope was, but he made it up to get more money because people would come and pay money and uh, to get the, the cardinals and the priests to pray their loved one's soul out of purgatory. Purgatory is supposed to be middle ground between heaven and hell. And there is no middle ground. It's either heaven or it's hell. 
Purgatory is not a Bible, is not a Bible doctrine. It's something that in the 13 or 14 or 1500s that a pope came up with to pay for the Vatican. They were building the Vatican. They needed money, so he came up with this new doctrine. It's not a Bible doctrine. When you leave this world, you'll go to heaven or you'll go to hell. The Bible said over in Luke 16 that the rich man was in hell. He died, and then he lifted up his eyes being in hell. In other words, he took his last breath, and the next thing he knew, he was in hell. These are horrible things, but these are factual things. Your soul is eternal. It goes somewhere when you leave this world. Therefore, you can see the worth of a soul. As I thought about that this week and thought about witnessing to people, and I thought, you know, what's the use? The idea comes to mind, you know, the soul is worth something. It's worth witnessing to. It's worth talking to. Because that eternal soul is going to spend eternity somewhere. All you are, as I said, is a soul with a body. And the most important part of you is that soul, and it's wrapped in a worthless, decaying body. One of these days, our souls will move out. The Bible says over there, Paul said over there, I believe it's in Corinthians, that uh, this body is a house. He says, if our earthly tabernacle of this body were dissolved, we have a house in heaven. In other words, uh, this body is just a house that we live in. And one of these days, we're going to move out. Now, it depends on what you've done with Jesus Christ. depends upon where you will go. That's the whole thing in a nutshell. What determines where your eternal soul will spend eternity is what you have done with Jesus Christ. The Lord said over there in, in John 14, He said, I am the way. Get that? I am the way, Jesus Christ said. I am the truth, and I am the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. There's only one way to heaven. And that's through Jesus Christ. Not the sacraments, not water baptism, not good works, not good deeds, not church membership. The only way to heaven is to know that you're a sinner and that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins and was buried and rose again, that the Son of God did that and that He was buried and that He rose again. And you and I are to put our faith and trust in what He did for our sins as a payment and you don't have to know all that when you get saved. All you've got to know is that you're a sinner and that the Son of God died on the cross for your sins and was buried and rose again. And that if you'll trust Him as your Savior, if you'll receive Him by faith into your heart, God will save you and you'll never have to worry about hell again. The body is just an earthly house. And your body is the least important of the two. But most men spend all their time and all their resources taking care of a body that they will soon depart with no thought of their souls. There are actually people in this world that believe that there is no hereafter. There are people that believe in this world that when they die, they're just dead like a dog and they're put in the ground and that's it. Now, do they really believe that? I don't know. They say that's what they believe, so you've got to take them at their word. But there are people that literally think that after this life, there is nothing else. Well, let me ask you this. What's the point of this life? What's the point of this life? If that's all there is, what's the point in living? Do you think, honestly, for one moment that Albert Einstein cares that he came up with the theory of relativity that created atomic energy? Do you think he cares about that now? Your soul is worth something. Everybody has a soul. Whoever you meet, your friends, your neighbors, your family, Everybody you meet has a soul or they wouldn't be walking around. In 
Now the Lord says, What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? What are people trading their eternal souls off for? What are they trading it for? Well, as I said, first thing you've got to notice is that the soul is worth something. And that's what the Lord says. What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? So the soul is worth something. The Bible said in Ezekiel 18, verse 4, He said, Behold, all souls are mine, as the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son. So all souls belong to God. Why? Because He's the Creator. He created them. It's His. You say, how come Israel has a right to that land over there? Because it was God and He gave it to them, according to the book of Jeremiah and many other places. God gave them that land because it was His to give. It belongs to Israel. The worth of the soul. Durability manifests worth. In other words, you take automobiles. You take a Mercedes Benz as opposed to a Chevrolet. Durability manifests worth. Now, Chevrolets are good cars. I don't drive one. I'm a Ford man or a Dodge man. I don't drive Chevrolets very much. I, not that I don't like them. I just don't. I just don't. But uh, I know this. I know that at one time, I don't know so much about now, but at one time Mercedes-Benz were called and thought of to be one of the best cars that was ever created. A Mercedes-Benz could easily get 300,000 miles when Chevrolets and Fords and Dodges and Chryslers and all that stuff were barely able to get 100,000 miles. Mercedes-Benz would be run at 100, 120 miles an hour over there on the Autobahn in Germany. Uh, I had fellows over there tell me, said, well, I'd be in the right lane, and all of a sudden I'd look, and here come a, a Mercedes-Benz flying by me at about 120 miles an hour. Well, now, you can, I'm not saying a Chevrolet won't run 120 miles an hour, but you won't run it that, that much at 120 miles an hour. But Mercedes-Benz were built to last. So, therefore, when you went to the car store to buy an automobile, if we went to the Chevrolet place, you found out the Chevrolet was this much money. If you went to the Mercedes-Benz, you find that the Mercedes-Benz is three and four times the cost of a Chevrolet. Why? They both take you from point A to point B. They both drive. They both steer. They both run. They both have motors. They have transmissions. But durability determines worth. It manifests worth. Mercedes-Benz would be on the road 10, 15 years later when the Chevrolets and the Fords were in the scrap pile. You take houses. Versus trailers. And if you live in a trailer, I'm not making fun of you. But the fact of the matter is, houses are worth more than trailers. So you have to pay more for a house than you do for a trailer. One soul will outlast the universe. One soul will outlast the whole universe. Therefore, that shows you the worth of the soul. It's worth more than the universe. Think about that. There's only two things on earth that will last for eternity, and that's the souls of men and the Word of God. Demand manifest worth. If nobody wants a certain thing, then it has no real value. I don't care what it is, how good it is. If nobody wants it, then it's not worth anything. I remember back in the 80s or 90s or whenever it was, uh, they came out with a stupid looking little doll and give my word stupid it's just a, it was just a real cheap looking made doll it's called Cabbage Patch y'all remember that? Cabbage Patch dolls but everybody had to have one they couldn't keep them in the stores everybody went to buy Cabbage Patch dolls what a joke but man I'll tell you what that thing had some worth to it why? because people demanded it they wanted it they wanted it and that's what it is, supply and demand. If a thing is wanted, if it's demanded, then the supply must be there. 
And if the supply is there, then they can pretty much charge what they want. You see what I'm saying? Your soul is desired by God and the devil. Now, the Lord owns the soul, but the devil knows that he can get that soul if he can keep you from trusting Jesus Christ as your Savior. And if he can keep you from doing that, then he can get your soul, your eternal soul, and put it into an eternal hell. And that's what the race is for between God and the devil. God wants you to live with him forever so much that he sent his only begotten son to die on the cross for your sins to be buried and rise again. That's how much God wants your soul. I know what it is to lose a son. And that's a hard thing. And I know the father, it broke his heart. But he loved man that much that he wanted to save him. The Bible said in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19, he said, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and that ye are not your own? For you are bought with a price. God paid for you. What did he pay? The blood of his son. That's how much your soul is worth. God's own blood. God's own blood. The worth of the soul is high. But there's a worthless exchange. He said there in verse 36, he said, What shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? That's a trade without profit. No sane man, unless he's got an ulterior motive, will trade and know that the trade he's trading for is going to destroy him. Nobody will do that. Yet men trade their souls for temporary pleasure in this life, knowing that eternity waits. Knowing that eternity waits. person that trades his soul for the world and what it affords can't keep what he's trading for. Even if you were able to trade your world, your, your soul for the whole world, you couldn't keep it. It's a trade without precedent. He said, he said, he said, for what shall it profit a man if he gained the whole world and lose his soul? But here's the deal. Nobody can gain the whole world. Nobody. They've tried. They've tried. Alexander the Great tried. Genghis Khan tried. Napoleon tried. Hitler tried. They all tried to gain the whole world. But none of them were able to, and neither are you. You cannot gain the whole world, but you can lose your own soul. You can't gain it all. Ecclesiastes 5.10 said, He that loveth silver shall not be satisfied with silver, nor he that loveth abundance with increase, this is also vanity. There's a wasted asset. If you tried to gain the whole world and then you lose your own soul, that is a wasted asset. I said, I quoted part of the verse over there in Ezekiel 18.4. He said, Behold, all souls are mine, and the, as the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son, and the soul that sinneth, it shall die. Well, guess what? There is none righteous, no, not one. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none that doeth good and sinneth not. Everybody's soul is a sinful soul. It's a wasted asset if you don't do something about it. A waste, it's, it's an irretrievable waste. Have you ever bought something and you were very dissatisfied with it, but you couldn't take it back? You couldn't get a refund? You, you couldn't trade it in? That's such a discouraging thing. If you lose your soul, it's lost forever. The Bible said in Revelation 20.10, he says that the lake of fire is torment that day and night forever and ever. You see, the soul can't die. It's in the process of dying, but it can't die because it's not physical. Therefore, it burns and burns forever and ever. Eternity is a place with no refunds, and it's a woeful regret. Don't you know right now, now listen to me, don't you know right now that there are people in hell on their knees pleading with God right now saying, Lord, I receive you as my Savior. I believe you died on the cross for my sin and was buried and rose again. 
I believe you. I want to trust you now as my Savior. Don't you know they're doing that right now? Don't you know they're right now, they're down there cursing God with all their might. They're cursing God. Don't you know that down there they remember the opportunities that they had to get saved, but they never got saved? It's a woeful regret. It's a wasted asset. Your soul is an asset. And if a man doesn't take care of that asset, he's going to lose his own soul. And you say, how, preacher, do I take care of that asset? You trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. He was God manifest in the flesh, the Son of God. He died on the cross for your sins. He shed His blood, and the Bible says in Acts 20 that it was God's blood that ran through the veins of Jesus Christ. He shed His blood on the cross for your sins, and He was buried and then he rose again on the third day. That's how you take care of that asset. Because if you don't take care of that asset, you're going to lose that asset. That's the way you have to look at people. They don't even know what they have. You ever seen anybody that had something that didn't know the value of what he had? That's an unsaved person. They don't know <clears throat> the value of their soul. Their soul is so important that God Himself died on the cross for our sins and was buried and rose again the third day. That's how valuable your soul is. It's worth more than the universe. That's how valuable a soul is. So next time you get out, and God deals with you about talking to somebody about the Lord, you remember this message. That soul is worth whatever you've got to do to witness to them. How about your soul today? I hope everybody here saved and trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior. But if you hadn't, today would be a good day to get that thing settled. Because once you settle it, it's settled forever. It's an eternal soul and it's an eternal salvation but also it's an eternal hell if you waste the asset. Father, thank you, Lord, for your blessings. Thank you for the time to be here.